Hello everyone, today we are going to start with a new chapter of biology class 9 that is the fundamental unit of life cell. And here in this chapter we are going to study about that how cell is our structural and functional unit of life or how why we are saying that cell is a basic unit of life. So here in this chapter we will just study about the whole concept of that what the cell is made up of, how it is made up of, how it was discovered and how that little tiny microscopic element that is the cell is responsible for functioning of such huge and large, large organisms and the smallest organisms which are present on earth. So here are the end of the chapter. We will just study about the functions of cell and the organisms which are responsible for the working of cell and its function. So here in this, we will start first with the introduction and the main statement of this chapter that is what is cell? The cell is the structure and functional unit of life of all the living organisms. Here we focus on two main things. That is number one structure. That is it is the cell which is providing a structure to the body of a living organism, to the life of a living organism. And also the second main important word that is functional. That means the cell is the one who is performing the major function, the responsible function for the life of a living organism. So here by this statement only we can conclude that how important these tiny cells are and how important these cells are for this making a life on this particular earth. Okay, so we have to start with the statement that is all living organisms in this universe are made up of cells, which we find out that yes, it is true that all the living organisms which we can see around, even if it is the smallest tiny organism, even if it is a bacteria or it is microscopic in nature, and the large organisms which we can see on earth, they all are made up of cells. And it just gets to uh, so amazing fact that how the cells, how the small tiny cells are responsible for the functioning of a small organism to a large organism as big as elephant. Okay. So now we will go into a little bit deeper concept by how the cells are able uh, to function such a large thing. Okay. So here we will see that what are the types and what are the classifications of cells. So you can classify cells on the basis of the number also. That in what number the cells are present in a living organism. So we can come into two things. That is number one unicellular organism and number two comes out to be multicellular organism. And here we can see by the word unicellular that means unit and the cell. That means by a single cell only. A living body, a living organism is surviving over there. That means only one single cell is responsible for the functioning of all the life processes in an organism, in a living organism. For example, the function of nutrition, the function of excretion, the function of transportation of material, and the function of respiration and producing energy. All these important functions are carried out only by just one single cell. And that is so amazing out there. Then we can also see a combination of multiple cells that is multicellular organism. And in that we can see that for each of the life processes that we perform, that a living organism perform, such as nutrition, then comes uh, respiration, transportation, and circulation, excretion, so on. All these functions are performed by different different cells and who are assigned to do their task regarding their life processes. So here we can see that these cells are assigned with the work. These cells are assigned with the labor. And here we can see a function of division of labor in multicellular organisms who make the function of that particular cell or, or in living organism so complex. So in unicellular organisms on one hand, we can see that the functioning are so simple and they are carried out in so easy and flawless way. But here, in a multicellular organism, we can see that the functions are so large and they are so entangled and they are so complex that it takes out so many cells and their tissues and all of the many components of the uh, living organism to come combining, to combining, to come collectively and perform the function in a living organism and that is also so amazing through this we are about cells. Then we can come to the second category that how we can classify cells as 
So the second category I can say about on the basis of the development of nuclear uh, nuclear membrane. By that also we can come across two categories. That is number one prokaryotic cells and number two comes out to be a eukaryotic cell. Now prokaryotic cell means primitive cells. That means that are the cells who do not have a well-defined nucleus. That is the brain of the cell and the well-defined nuclear membrane. That is the covering of the nucleus. And then we come up with the category of prokaryotic organisms or prokaryotic cells. That means these are the cells which do not have a well-defined nucleus and the nuclear membrane is there, which comes then, uh, which coagates them into a category of a prokaryotic one. And the example can be taken as bacteria for this. Then we can uh, come to the next category, that is the eukaryotic cells, who are seen as the organisms with two nucleus. That means they are the organisms who have a well-defined nucleus and nuclear membrane with them. And the example can be taken as the plant, the animal, and the puppy you see around. So, there is the second category over here. Then we can see of the third category depending on the basis of the structure and how different the structure can be. And here we can see two examples. That is number one, the plant cell, which we see in the plant. And number two can come out as the animal cell, which we see in all, the, in all of the animals. So here I have made this classification of the three. That is number one. On the basis of number, unicellular, multicellular, on the basis of the structure of the nucleus, the presence of the nuclear membrane, that is prokaryotic and eukaryotic, and on the basis of the structure, that is the plant cell and the animal cell. So we are going to study all the same collectively in this chapter in a great detail. Now, first, let us see that how the cells have been discovered. How this cell came into the existence of the mind of the human and how it discovered the cell. So it was discovered, uh, it was discovered first by Robert Cook in the year 1665 and he noted the first cell with a microscope in the uh, in the cock line. So he took a cock line from a plant and then under a uh, microscope he just observed that they are so empty spaces. Or there were some uh, border like things or some pattern like things which he could then, which he assumed that, that they are some type of proof and he named them as cells and in a plural form he called them as cells. Then further, in further years, that is in 1674, Anton and Leland Hook came and he found the presence of living cells in the pond water. Okay, and he observed that the cells under his microscope. So here we can get to know this that Robert Cook in 1665 has seen the cells, but the cells were dead in nature. Okay, that means he was he identified the cells, he named them the, uh, as cells, but the cell which he saw was dead in nature. And then Anton Will even know after some years in 1674 found out the living cells, and then the concept of cell was uh, further studied and recognized, and then it was told that the yes, living organisms are comprised. Then further we will see to the next sentence. Now then came Robert Brown in 1831 and he recognized the existence of nucleus in the cell. Okay, so Robert Brown was the one who recognized and who find out that yes, a cell also consists of nucleus with it and which is responsible for all the major functioning of the uh, all of the major functioning of the cell and all the major activities of the cell, and hence they are also known as the brain of the cell. Then came Perkinshine in 1839, he invented the term protoplasm, which is uh, the liquid present inside the cell. So protoplasm over there is termed as, he is, uh, it has been given a specific name, that as living fluid of the cell. That means protoplasm is the living fluid of the cell, and protoplasm is not only the protoplasm, it is made up of comprising cytoplasm, that is the cellular fluid, and nucleoplasm, that is the fluid of the nucleus. They both combine and they both combine and form protoplasm, which is known as the living fluid of the cell. And the name was given by Perkinson in 1839. They came Clinton and Swan in 1838 and 1839 and they presented the third theory and they told the world that all the living organisms are actually made 
be a box cell and they just concluded that that whatever the living organisms we see around us, whether they are microscopic, whether they are present on the earth, whether we can see them with naked eyes or not, they all are made up of the cell bones. And then in 1855 came Burkow and he just added one more statement in the cell theory and he said that all cells come from the cells which are already existing in nature. That means the cell arises, the new cells develop, the new cells come, but they always come from the pre-existing cells. That is, this is the process of reproduction by which we can understand that all the cells which we are having in our body, in any of the body in the universe, they all are existing. They all are deriving from the pre existing cell, which we can consider as a process of reproduction also. Then we can just uh, look at the cell theory statement. So here we can see the cell theory. So now we have the uh, basic statement with us that the cell is the structural and functional unit of all the living organisms. That for the life of a living organism, we have a cell which is responsible for its structural component and also for its functional component. That means it is the only cell which is responsible for creating a living organism. It is just like a brick of a house we can say, like for making a house, making a room, we require brick and brick by brick to make a wall and then to make a house to build a house. Similarly here we require cell for making it structurally and functionally possible for a living organism to live. Then comes all the living organisms are made up of cell. That is the second statement that what are the living organisms do we have on us? They all are made up of cell. And then comes cell are formed by the pre existing cells. That means all the living organisms or all the cells which are present in them, they all exist from the pre existing cells and the new cells are formed. Then we will see over the unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms, which I have explained you earlier. Then the organism that consists of a single cell are known as unicellular organisms such as amoeba. Amoeba is one of the examples for unicellular organisms. Similarly, you can just search up for many number of organisms or other examples for the unicellular organisms and you can mention them in your books uh, which will help you in during the time of the plan. Then from multicellular organisms, the organisms which contain Various cells that perform different functions in the organism, such uh, as plant, grass, plant, animals, and fungi. So here, by the statement, we can see that the organisms which contain various cells, they have n number of cells in their body, and that all cells are assigned with a task, assigned with a function to do particularly, and that type of organisms are known as multicellular organisms. In simple words, we can see, uh, we can say that. Multicellular organism shows the division of the world into them. Okay, now here we can see how can multicellular organism originate from a single cell. Okay, so a cell has the capability to divide itself into cells of its own type. Okay, so here that if we can see the question again, how can multicellular organism originate from a single cell? Okay, so multicellular organism, how they are coming up from a single cell. So here the definition says that. A cell has the capacity to divide itself into the cells of its own type. So that means if a cell is of a particular type, then the cells which will be coming up from that particular cell or which will be coming from the cell division from that particular cell will be of its parent type only. Okay? And then therefore more cells can generate from an already existing cell. And that is why the cells of the same type can be generating can be generated from the pre existing cells again and again by the process of cell division. Now, let's see to the next thing. Now, we are on the next topic that is the shape and size of the cell. Now, here I will just show you some of the examples and I will also mention some of the important uh, facts regarding the topic. Now, see, we will see that. In a human organism, or sorry, in a living organism, we can see that all the cells are of different shapes and different sizes. Now, why the cell? Like earlier we have seen unicellular, multicellular, then earlier we saw eukaryotic, prokaryotic. Now, here we can see a heading that shape and size of the cell. Now, 
which are responsible uh, yeah, which are known as the producers of our ocean okay and then we have alum ocean which is having a super shaped like uh, structure and this is a unicellular or one type of uh, organism it performs its own function by itself okay so now here we have such examples which we can see then some more examples we can take is you now one example we have seen of WDC WDC are irregular shaped or I think you can say it as amoeboid shaped cells okay and they as they have shape of an amoeba amoeboid shape means the organism which have a very irregular shape of their cell membrane and they are from that amoeboid shape and as they have this amoeboid shape with them by that what they can do is they can perform phagocytosis they can engulf the food particles or the pollen particles which are trying to enter the body and this destroy them by taking them inside the cytoplasmic region and, this, uh, and by this uh, disrupting them into their form. Okay? So that is also one of the function of WBC. That's why they have such type of irregular shaped cells so that they can perform phagocytosis easily. So now we are going to see that uh, how can cells perform distinct functions in organisms. That means how cells are responsible to perform different different functions in an organism. So we can see here, cells are capable of performing multiple functions in an organism. A cell can be specific com com uh, components which are called as organisms. Okay, which are also known as cell organisms. And what does the cell organism mean over here? The organs of the cell are termed as cell organisms. Okay. Now each organ in the cell can perform different functions such as making new cells or clearing the base of the cell, etc. Okay. So here we can see that we have the organs inside the cell also which are able to perform the functions. That means we can see that in a cell also there are distinct functions which are divided among other other organs inside the cell who are assigned to do different different tasks at the same time or either whenever it is required. And some of the functions which I mentioned over here are making new cells, clearing the base of the cells, etc. Now, thus, organisms allow a cell to perform several kinds of activities in an organism. So, there is an organism inside a cell which is allowing the cell to perform so many types of functions at the same time or whenever it is required. So, here, the all pretty good to who? The cell organisms who are efficiently doing their work whenever they are safe or whenever they are required for. Now, we see the types of organelles and the components of the cell which will uh, exit the chapter 2. Now, see, here is uh, the next thing, the, the, the next criteria, the organization of a cell, that uh, is the structure and components of the cell. Now, what are the structure and components of the cell? We will see in this chapter. Now, here, I have just taken a picture of animal cell and the plant cell, by which you can see that in this cell, what are the number of organelles which we have? Because we were talking about the cell, that what is actually a cell. And uh, earlier we have seen that we have cell organelles inside a cell which is responsible for performing so many distance at a time. So here you can see animal cell also and the plant cell also over here, which have so many organelles inside them. Here you know, a cell has so many organelles, organelles inside them. And like that, there, may, there must be so many cells in a animal or other in a plant and there would be so many organelles also working at the same time inside the cell. It is so fascinating. Now there we will see a cell contains three features. Okay, now the three components of the cell we will see over here. Number one is the plasma membrane which is also known as the cell membrane or either as a semi-permeable membrane or either as a selectively permeable membrane. Then we have number two, nucleus, and then at number three, we have the cytoplasm. These are the three main components of the cell which a cell has. Then we will see plasma membrane number one, the first component of the cell that is the plasma membrane. Now, what is actually a plasma membrane? It is also generally known as a cell membrane. Now, the word membrane over here means just an outer covering of the cell. Or any other organ also can have a membrane over them. So, that membrane probably means that having a outer covering on it. Okay? So, 
So here you can see it is just like an envelope that covers the whole cell. So it is just working as an envelope like particle or a covering that is protecting the cell from the outer surrounding. That means it is ensuring that the cell do not interact with the outer world or the outer surrounding and all its function remains intact in their one particular body part only. Now therefore our cell gets separated from the external environment because it has a plasma membrane. So just because of plasma membrane, the cell remains separated with the outer world. Now here we can see the plasma membrane has the capacity to decide which material should enter or leave the cell and which should not. And that is the reason why they are known as semi-permeable membrane or selectively permeable membrane. That means it would either allow partial movement or either it will allow only the selected movement of substance inside and outside the cell. That means it is only the plasma membrane who will decide who is going to enter the cell and who is going to live out the live out the live out, out of the cell. Okay? So that's why they are known as selectively permeable membrane also. That is one of the components which we need to understand and remember about plasma membrane because this is a very important feature of plasma membrane which helps us to understand the various functions related to the functioning of the cell. Now we will see a model which is made on plasma membrane and which is known as the fluid mosaic model which was made by the scientists named Singer and Corbin. Okay, and they only gave us that this particular model that is fluid mosaic model for a better understanding of plasma membrane and how then how it is made up of and how it functions. So now here you can see the fluid mosaic model explains the structure of plasma membrane. According to it, the plasma membrane comprises of three components. Number one is lipid, number two is protein, and number three is carbohydrate. So we can say that if it is asked that of what component is the plasma membrane made of, then you can easily say that the plasma membrane is made up of lipid, proteins, and some components of carbohydrate too. Then you will get to see that uh, these components can flow freely and fluidly inside the plasma membrane. So these three components are in a fluid nature and they are able to move freely inside the plasma membrane and they are also the main constituent in making of the plasma membrane also. Now there are, there are two types of uh, lipids that is packed in the plasma membrane. They are cholesterol and phospholipid. Now we will just see the way. Okay, now we are in this. You can see over here. We have seen earlier that what are the two types of lipids the object of plasma membrane is made up of. So here we have phospholipid. It is a lipid made up of glycerol. Two fatty acids and phosphate. It creates a semi-permeable membrane. Now here this point becomes the focal point over here that due to the phospholipid only, a plasma membrane is having a feature of semi-permeability. Otherwise, it would not have that. Okay? Which allows you to flow only certain material inside or outside of the cell. So, if anyone asks you that which component in the plasma membrane is responsible for giving the function of semi permeability to the plasma membrane, so your answer would be so easy. It would be either liquid, and if you are if you are able to remember it in detail, then you can also say that it is phospholipid. Okay? Otherwise, liquid would be also okay. Now then, for your second point is the second fat or the second lipid component which you have in the plasma membrane is it is a lipid which provides fluidity to the surface of the plasma membrane. Okay, so as we have seen earlier that we have three components: lipid, cholesterol, and carbohydrate in the plasma membrane of which it is made up of. And here we can see that that fluid texture which the plasma membrane is gaining and in which the cholesterol sorry, in which your lipids uh, and your carbohydrates and protein are able to flow freely. That is just because of what? Cholesterol. Okay. So if again the question comes that uh, how is plasma membrane that means the fluidity in which your protein carbohydrates are able to flow easily, so that is just because of cholesterol, you can use an answer. Okay. Now then we have seen the functions of uh, fat. That what is the function of lipids in the making of the plasma membrane? Now we will see what is the, uh, this protein do into the plasma membrane. Now the protein acts as a receptor of the cell and helps in the transportation 
of toxin across the cell membrane. So here, as we have seen, that your plasma membrane is having a function of semi-permeability, or I think we can say selectively permeable membrane. Okay. So if it is acting as a selectively permeable membrane, then how it is able to select the substance which are allowed into the cell or which are not allowed into the cell? So by this, we can get that it is the protein as it is acting as a receptor. So the protein which is acting as a receptor will allow the plasma membrane to enter the substance into it or either to reject them. Okay. So here the protein is the one who is allowing the uh, cell or the plasma membrane to get uh, into the uh, medium of or to get into the process of selectively permeability. Okay. So here by this statement, this thing also comes uh, like uh, in your clear thing. Now the carbohydrates attach themselves with the lipids and proteins and are found on the extracellular side of the membrane. That is, uh, you are, uh, sorry, the carbohydrates which are present, they are attached to the extracellular side, that is the, to the outer part of the cell and they are attached with lipids and proteins. Okay, that means your carbohydrates are attached with both the components, that is the lipids and the protein. And they are found on the extracellular side of the membrane. Okay, so here we come to the end of the structure of the plasma membrane. That how your plasma membrane is made up of. So we will just have a quick revision. It is made up of three things: that is, lipid, carbohydrates, and protein. And it also moves into a free uh, fluid pattern. And then we have two types of lipids: the last, that is, in the plasma membrane. Sorry. That is phospholipid and cholesterol. Then we have protein which is acting as a receptor. And then we have carbohydrates which are attached to the proteins and the lipids at the same time on the extracellular side of the family. Now we will just have a look on the fluid mosaic model which was given by Seymour and Nicholson about the plasma membrane. Okay. So here in this diagram, if you see, this is a particular layer that is membrane. As plasma membrane is a membrane bound organism and it is double layer also, so it has a uh, it has the upper side and the lower side with it. Okay, and then here you can see some protein channel over here. So this protein channel is acting as a passage from where your substance can enter inside the cell or either can move out of the cell also. Okay, and here you can see some glycoprotein over here. Protein with carbohydrate attached. Okay, so these are the proteins which are attached with the carbohydrate. And here you can see in the yellow part, glycolipids, that is the lipid with carbohydrate attached. That is, and it is on the extracellular side. So now by that you can judge that what is the extracellular side of the cell? It is the upper part, it is the outer part of the cell, which is acting as an extracellular side of the cell. Okay, so now we will uh, continue uh, with this. Approve uh, for the plasma membrane uh, structure, and now we will move to the movement of substance and how movement of substance takes place. Because we were talking about in plasma membrane that it uh, offers selectively permeability and it is semi permeable in nature. So we should know that how movement across the channel occurs in the plasma membrane. And we have two types of movement over here. Number one is diffusion and number two is osmosis. Now just let's uh, have a look towards what is the diffusion and what is osmosis over here. So here you can see how can substance move in and out of a cell. So here how a substance is able to move come in and out of a cell. So here comes the question. Now what will be the answer for it? Gas gaseous exchange between the cell and its external environment occurs by the process of diffusion. Okay, so diffusion is what? Diffusion is movement of substance which is to be highlighted. That is diffusion is movement of substance from high concentration of the cell to the lower concentration of the cell or either the environment. Okay, so here you can see movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the cell is carried out by the means of diffusion. That means if we see the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the cell component, that means you have a cell and it is filled with oxygen or I think it is filled with carbon dioxide and it will then uh, exchange the gases with its surrounding 
and it will move uh, sorry the movement of the gases will only be in the direction of higher concentration to the lower concentration for that you can understand it by a simple example like for example your rbc that is the red blood cells are filled up with oxygen okay as they enter into the lung and they get oxygenated and then they will move to the other part of the cell and as your oxygenated rbc is moving to the other part of the cell it will reach out to the other cellular components which will be filled with carbon dioxide okay now as rbc is filled with of oxygen now that oxygen is having the higher concentration on the rbc side now the cell is required with oxygen and the cell is having a lower concentration of oxygen from its side so now here is the high concentration and here we have a low concentration so now the gas will move from higher concentration towards the lower concentration and the oxygen which is filled in the rbc will move to the cell part and the carbon dioxide which is filled into the cell will move to the rbc okay so now by that thing we can make it out very much clear then how the movement of gases takes place it takes place only from the high concentration towards the lower concentration of the cell now next or uh, uh, in the next thing we can see that gaseous substances have a tendency to move to the areas where their concentration is less from the areas where there is high okay we need to this is the sentence again for better understanding what i have told you all here that the movement of gas can occur from where from higher concentration to lower concentration here we are going to see that only gaseous substances have a tendency to move to the area from a higher concentration towards the concentration where there is a low concentration okay so this movement is defined as the process of diffusion okay so here again i will see the definition of diffusion it is movement of substances movement of substances means it can be either solid either liquid or either gas and the movement will be towards the higher concentration to the lower concentration and that will be termed as diffusion in biology the diffusion can take place in solid liquid and gas okay so that is the thing if we are we need to use the word that is substance and substance or we can come that is solid liquid and gas and the second most important thing which we need to be kept in mind is that the movement will occur from a higher concentration towards the lower concentration that is the important thing which we need to remember in the terms and in the concept of diffusion